Over 50 years ago, Jim Whitaker became the first American to summit Everest. However, just three weeks after his historic feat, another team from the same group made an even more remarkable attempt on the unconquered west ridge of the mountain. On May 4, the expedition's official historian sent a dispatch about the expedition's big news. Three days earlier, on May 1, the 6-foot, 5-inch store manager from Seattle named James Big Jim Whitaker became the first American to climb Mount Everest. At first, the names of Whitaker and his Sherpa climbing partner, Nawang Gambu, were kept secret. The expedition's leader, Norman Dyernfirth, didn't want their accomplishments to overshadow the other teams still trying to make the summit. At least two more teams were trying to summit the mountain, one of them via a fearsome new route up the West Ridge. Despite being ten years after Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay's historic first ascent, Whitaker's triumph was big news back home in the USA. The American Mount Everest expedition was more than just a race to claim bragging rights. It was a proxy battle among nations during the height of the Cold War. The Soviets were rumored to have attempted the mountain from the north in 1952 and failed. In 1956, the Swiss made the second ascent, and the Chinese made a bid in 1960. All but one of the 8,000-meter peaks had been summited by then. The expeditions to climb these peaks were massive, military-style campaigns with siege-like tactics, top-down chains of command, and a focus on the collective rather than the individual. From an outsider's perspective, the American expedition to Mount Everest was no different. The expedition required a large team, including over 900 porters who carried 27 tons of equipment into base camp. The expedition was organized like a military detachment, with Norman Dyeron Firth in charge and the other men given ministerial titles. It's fascinating to think about the incredible effort and resources it took to mount such an expedition, and while the golden age of Himalayan mountaineering may have been winding down, the achievement of Whitaker and Gombu on Mount Everest was no less impressive. However, in 1963, a new generation of climbers joined the American expedition with a different approach to mountaineering. They prioritized style and route difficulty rather than simply conquering Virgin Summit. Leading this group were Tom Hornbean, a 32-year-old anesthesiologist from St. Louis, and Willie Unsold, a 36-year-old Peace Corps staffer based in Kathmandu. Hornbean and Unsold were not interested in summiting via the South Coal route and instead wanted to tackle a more difficult route, the West Ridge. Their unconventional approach posed a significant risk and threatened to upend the expedition. The summit push began with Unsold, Hornbean, Corbett, Emerson, five Sherpas, and the expedition radio operator Al Autan transporting supplies up the west shoulder to stock Camp 3 and establish Camp 4 at 25,000 feet. However, their mission was difficult from the beginning, as a windstorm on the west shoulder almost thwarted them on May 16. That night, Hornbean and Unsold were jolted awake by Auten's screams. With his head stuck in the door, he shouted that the tents had blown away. The team discovered the tents were upside down 150 feet downhill with Corbett and Tashi Sherpa still inside. Luckily, none of them were hurt as they tumbled down the mountain. The wind strengthened the next morning, reaching 100 miles per hour. Clinging to their ice axes and lying prone in their tents, they held on for dear life, hoping not to be blown away. With the loss of equipment, the West Ridgers had given up on establishing and stocking the last two camps to reach the summit. With little hope left, Hornbean suggested a new plan to ascend to 27,000 feet and set up a single two-person tent at Camp 5. Hornbean and Unsold would push for the summit in a single day, then descend toward the South Coal and stay at Camp 6. The plan was deemed a one last desperate effort and a suicide mission as the thought of covering 4,000 vertical feet of steep, unknown terrain in two days, all above 25,000 feet, and then trying to descend via an unfamiliar route was never attempted before. Additionally, the climb would be a one-way trip, as they would not have enough supplies to return via the West Ridge. If things didn't go to plan, it was either summit and go over the top or die on the mountain. Hornbean and Unsold's decision and climb would mark a new age of light and fast climbing that would define the strict standards of modern alpinism. On May 21, five Sherpas led Hornbean and Unsold up to an 18-inch wide ledge right below the yellow band. Ang Dorje reached the top first and rested, pulling off his oxygen mask and lighting a cigarette. They were at an altitude of 27,250 feet. 
The team helped Hornbean and Unsold set up their two-person tent and bid them farewell, acknowledging that it could be the last time they saw each other. That night, Hornbean wrote a letter to his wife, knowing he would only see her again if he reached the summit. At 4 a.m., they got up, ate, and put on their crampons in the dark. Just before 7, they left their camp for good. They climbed up through the couloir, where it cut through the yellow band. When it narrowed at the top, they had to climb two limestone pitches, hammering pitons into the rotten rock. By noon, they had reached the mountain's upper flanks but were disoriented and couldn't figure out which route led to the summit. The two radioed to Whitaker and base camp for guidance, but he couldn't offer support. Hornbean and Unsold decided to traverse back toward the West Ridge, which they thought would take them to the summit. At 3 p.m., they stopped for lunch on a rocky slab in the middle of the traverse. When they returned to the ridge, they encountered a series of rocky cliffs that Hornbean described as three or four areas of delightful rock climbing and then a bit of rottenness. Unsold led the climb, and after removing their crampons, they made slow progress toward the summit throughout the afternoon. At around 6, 15 p.m., Unsold saw the American flag planted by Whitaker three weeks prior describing it as shining in the sun and flapping in the breeze. However, with little daylight remaining and another 2,000 feet to descend, there was little time for celebration. Unsold contacted Maynard Miller on the radio, who answered from Camp 2, overjoyed by their accomplishment. He asked if there was any sign of Bishop and Jerstad. Unsold confirmed there were faint tracks, which became a lifeline as they descended in the darkness. They rappled over the Hillary Step and soon found themselves enveloped in darkness. Hornbean and Unsold shouted into the night. They discovered Bishop and Jerstad, who had become lost themselves. It was 9.30 p.m., and all four men had been climbing for over 14 hours straight. Hornbean gave Bishop and Jerstad a couple of pills of dexedrine, and they continued to stumble and fall down the mountain while trying to keep each other awake. After making little progress, the exhausted group finally decided to bivouac at 12, 30 a.m. Without a tent or sleeping bag, a bivouac above 28,000 feet can be a death sentence. Even with modern equipment, it often leads to frostbite and the loss of digits. Dry lightning was visible over the plains of India to the east, and there was no moon. However, the night was unusually calm, and none of the men recalled suffering. Unsold massaged Hornbean's bare feet against his exposed belly, likely saving his toes. The sky lightened at 4.30 a.m., but the men didn't move until the sun rose an hour later. Bishop was delirious as they began to descend. Dingman was waiting for them at the bottom, thinking he was coming up for Jerstad and Barry's bodies. After a brief stop for rest and tea at Camp 6, the exhausted group reached Camp 2 around 10.30 p.m., some 40 hours after they began climbing the day before. While on their descent on the Lotsey face, Unsold radioed his wife, who was in Kathmandu at the American Embassy, and promised her that it would be his last big climb. With the soles of their feet frozen and hardened, they hobbled to the icefall one last time, stopping where Breitenbach had died, who'd been killed by a collapsing wall a few days before. Bishop thought, Jake, we have the mountain for you. Chirpus carried Bishop and Unsold down to Namshi Bazaar from base camp, where they could take a helicopter back to Kathmandu. Unsold lost nine toes, and Bishop lost all ten. As expected, the press focused on Whitaker's achievement rather than the group's heroic feat. Life and National Geographic attempted to explain the significance of the West Ridge, but the South Coal route stole the spotlight. Whitaker became the face of the expedition. Despite this, Hornbean's book, Everest, The West Ridge, gained popularity among climbers over the years. John Krakauer cited Hornbean and Unsold as early heroes in Into Thin Air and recently wrote a new foreword to Hornbean's book. Unsold, known for his eloquence, never chronicled his own experiences, but his accomplishments were not forgotten. He became a philosophy and outdoor education professor at Evergreen State College in Washington. Despite promising to abstain from big climbs, he joined his daughter on an expedition to India's Himalayas. In 1976, Aiming to conquer the mountain he had named after her, Nanda Devi. Tragically, Devi Unsold passed away from altitude sickness in the tent at High Camp, with her father and fiancé by her side. The West Ridge remains one of the most challenging Himalayan routes, and will likely remain so. Only 17 climbers have repeated variations of Hornbean and Unsold's ascent in the past 50 years, 
with 13 perishing in the process. Like all great mountaineering feats, the West Ridge is only attainable for those who are fully committed. Perhaps Hornbean described his mindset on that final day best. The total feeling of detachment with anything else in the world that seemed to matter, family. Child, only Mount Everest was there at the time, and only the summit above us seemed to be beckoning me.